Good morning. We're going to be in John chapter 15 this morning. So if you'll turn in your Bibles to John chapter 15, we're going to start in verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Lord, we just thank you so much for this passage. We thank you so much, Lord, for your word. Uh, there's so many things that are different and unusual and um, different about our circumstances today, but Lord, you are the same, and your word is still the same. And Lord, we pray exactly that. We pray that, that though everything around us may be different situations or, or uh, changes, Lord, <laughs> your word is the same, and we pray that you would speak to us the same. And we pray this in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. So I have to admit that John chapter 15 is my favorite chapter in the Bible. I've been looking forward to this one for a while, uh, since pretty much when I found out the church was in the book of John. <laughs> I was excited about teaching John 15. Uh, this chapter in, has my favorite chapter of the Bible, has my favorite verse of the Bible. Uh, reason being, this is the chapter that uh, really introduced me to Jesus and having a relationship with him and giving my life to him and following him. This is the passage that led me to do that. Um, so it's a special passage to me and I'm excited that I get to teach it to you this morning. Uh, he starts off right in the beginning, I am the true vine. And here he's saying, I am the true vine. It's very similar to when he's talking to, when God is talking to Moses and Moses says, but who am I going to say sent me? And he says, tell them I am sent you. Uh, and, and so here he's saying, I am, he's saying, I'm, I am God. God is the true vine. Uh, he continues, my father is the vine dresser. And he talks in verse two about what the father being the vine dresser means is that he's going to prune us. Uh, verse 2, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may be more fruitful. Now, if you've ever done gardening, you know, sometimes things need to be pruned for them to grow better, and that's exactly what the Lord's going to do with us. Sometimes we're going to be in situations where he's going to be pruning us and working on us, um, and it's not always super comfortable. <laughs> uh, it's not always pleasant. Uh, but sometimes the Lord's going to be working on us and pruning us and, and, and helping us to grow better. Uh, and in the end, it says in, in the end of verse 2, that we would be more fruitful. Uh, that we would bear more fruit. And kind of that idea of somebody who doesn't allow God to work on them is not going to be bearing more fruit. And if you think about it, the, uh, the idea, there's a lot of people that they kind of set up their lives to make it so that God can't work on them. They won't let the word, the word of God in to penetrate their hearts, to work on their hearts. They will close their ears when the word of God tries to come. And, and they get to the point of where they're not willing to allow God to work on them. Um, but we know exactly that. We know that the Lord wants to work in us and on us and through us. And we know that the Lord uh, in, in his, there's verses all through the Bible that talk about his working on us. Uh, one of the most famous ones is, is probably when he says, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. Uh, and so here we, we get a really good picture of the Lord working on us and pruning us. In, in verse 3, he talks about, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Here he, he tells us that one of the ways that he's going to work on us or make us clean is using his word. He's going to use his word 
to clean us, to cleanse us, so to speak. And he's going to do this. And all through scripture, we, we see Jesus talking about this. Later in a couple of chapters, when we get to John chapter 17, we're going to get to a famous verse when Jesus says, cleanse them with my word. Uh, there's passages in, in the epistles that talk about um, being washed with the water of the word. And, and so this idea of using God's word, that God would use his word to cleanse us. Uh, it reminds me of Psalm 119.9. Uh, Psalm 119.9 says, how can a young man keep his way pure? And it answers the question in, in the next part of the verse saying, by taking heed to your word. Uh, and, and so God's going to use his word to cleanse us. Uh, part of that pruning process we were talking about where God works on us is he's going to use his word to cleanse us. And as he does that, he's going to use his word to transform us. Now, uh, I've used the illustration before, uh, but I, I didn't really fully understand this aspect when I was a new believer. Uh, the, the idea of, I always had the question of, if God loves me so much, then why would he want to change me? Why would he want to work on me? Why would he want to transform me? And I, I never really understood that. I, I started really understanding that better after I became a parent. <laughs> because I love my children dearly. Uh, and if they're acting two when they're 15 that's a problem <laughs> there needs to be some growth and my care for them part of my care for them is that i i, I want to see them grow uh, and so i started to really understand it in that aspect after i became a parent because i started seeing the lord loves me so much that he wants me to grow that he wants to transform me that he wants to build me up he wants to uh, work on me because he loves me. Uh, and, and so that, that's when it became more clear to me. In verse 4, we get to this word abide. In verse 4, Jesus says, abide in me. This is going to be a constant theme of this passage. And actually, <laughs> Jesus is pretty much begging in this passage for us to abide in him. He's going to use the words abide <laughs> in this passage He's going to use the word abide 10 times. And that's not even counting, that's just in this chapter, but it's not even counting the times in this chapter where he says remain in me or things like that that are, are similar and mean the same. But he's going to use the word abide 10 times in this chapter because he's just begging us, abide in me, remain in me. So as we read through this, kind of know that that's, that's the heart that Jesus is getting to here. You remember that this is Jesus talking to his disciples, and this is the last night he has with them. If you remember, we were studying John chapter 13, and that's when they started teaching in the upper room. And, and chapters 13 and 14 were Jesus' last real teachings, like sitting the disciples down and teaching them. And he decided that it was the most important things to teach them about serving and relying on the Holy Spirit. And so, here then they leave the room, and, and they're now walking, and Jesus is still teaching them, and, and these are the things that he's teaching. Uh, I wonder sometimes if, he, during this teaching of behind in the branches, if he's, if they're walking through, like, or if they're walking by vines, he might have held them in his hand and said, you know, I am the true vine when he's holding them. But in verse 4, he says, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Here, it, it, it's very similar in to, it reminds me of another verse that says that we can do all things through Christ, but we can do nothing apart from him. And it reminds me of Philippians 4.13, where, 
where we're told we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. But the opposite of the coin is too, true too. We, we, apart from him, we can do nothing. And, and so here he's, he's saying, abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. If you want to see the Lord working in your life, you have to abide in Jesus. Uh, it, it, it's, and it comes down to, again, when, when he was, he's just crying out in this passage of, of continue to have a relationship with him, continue to abide in him. That's what he's going to be crying out to us in, in this in this chapter. Verse 5, he continues, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. And if anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burnt. So it's a very clear picture that he's giving us. But what do you do with the dead branches? Fall time when all the dead branches fall on the yard and all the dead leaves and the dead branches, and they're gathered up and they're thrown in the fire. I remember when we when we lived in uh, the foothills, we, out there we had burn piles. And so we would uh, gather up all the stuff and we'd put it in a burn pile. Uh, and, and that's what you did with the dead branches. Hey, we put them in the burn pile, and that's what he's saying. He's saying to set your life up to be apart from Jesus is to make your life pointless, and it's it's as good as anything that's going to be thrown into the fire. And, and so he's saying it, it's almost part of his begging, abide in me, as he's showing us, the opposite of abiding me is being like the branch that's going to get picked up and thrown in the fire because it's no longer connected to the vine. It's no longer bearing fruit. It no longer serves purpose. And so he continues in verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Here he's teaching us why abiding in him helps us. And the way us abiding in him helps us is his word abides in us. When we're abiding in Jesus and we're remaining in a relationship with him, when we're staying close to him in a relationship with him, then we're allowing his word to abide in us and to lead and guide us. We're allowing, we're kind of uh, like, uh, we're allowing his heart and his mindset to kind of be adapted in our lives because we're remaining in him and we're allowing his heart and his mindset to to be ours, to be similar to ours. To, to, uh, we're kind of taking on his heart and his mindset by just being so close with him. Uh, and he helps us through his word abiding in us, through his we regain his heart, and through his help, he's right there in prayer. Uh, when Jesus is abiding in, and when we're abiding in Jesus and he's abiding in us, it's, we're, we feel super close to him when we feel like help is not that far away. Uh, but it's during times where we've been distant with the Lord and we run into things that then we feel isolated or, or alone. And we know that we're not. We know the Lord still pursues us. But we still feel that way. And right now, I'm there, there's a lot of people right now that probably feel isolated and alone. I mean, if you think about it, we're having to give sermons to a camera. I never thought I'd be doing that. Uh, but, but there's a lot of people that are feeling isolated and alone right now because they're, we we're told to stay in our homes and we're not meeting at the church like we regularly do. And some of you might be feeling isolated or, or alone. And I would just like to encourage you that you're not. That you can always abide in Jesus. That, that he's right there wanting to abide in you. He's right there begging you, abide in me, abide in me. And 
here he in verse 7 he says if you abide in me and my words abide in you you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you this is very similar to uh <laughs> in john 10 and and john 14 when when we were going over those passages and, and jesus was saying ask and it will be given now we know the clarifier is that <laughs> we, he's not saying like ask i want a lamborghini <laughs> and Boom. When you go outside, if you eventually get to go outside, uh, when you go outside, it'll be there. That's not what he's saying. Uh, what he's saying is he's saying, ask the things you need of to glorify me, to do my work. Ask for those things and it will be given to you. Uh, you're never going to be put in a situation where God's asking you to do something for him, but yet he's not also equipping you to do that same thing. So here God's talking about pruning us so that we could be more fruitful. And then he continues and he, he tells us here in verse 7, Hey, look, I'm going to help you. I'm going to be there. If you abide in me, I'm there as your helper. And, and you can always turn to me and ask for, for what you need to get through it. And, and so there's, there's a lot of situations right now that are maybe anxiety creating situations maybe there's some anxiousness there's some worry that's creeping in but there's a lot of situations right now that could create that um, you could be worried about the virus you could be worried about loved ones you could be worried about losing touch with people and relationships being affected there's a lot of things to be worried or anxious about right now and what what God is saying is he's saying abide in him and pray to him all those things and he will meet your needs in those ways. He'll meet your needs in those ways. Uh, it reminds me of Philippians chapter 4 verses 6 and 7 uh, where we're told don't be anxious about things, don't be worried about things, but instead come to the Lord in prayer and the peace, God's peace will guard your heart and your mind. And the, here, it's very similar to that. He's saying, it, God's going to prune you. God's going to work on you. And, and in your life, when you're in, in situations where uh, the Lord is at work, and maybe it's scary to you what the Lord's doing, uh, then pray to him. And he's going to answer you in those times. And so that's what he means here when he says, uh, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. He's saying anytime you feel a need, anytime you feel like, Lord, I'm not sure, then bring those to the Lord. Uh, the last thing he wants us to do is to put on this fake uh, act like we have no worries or concerns and, and uh, we have this perfect faith. He wants us to come to him with our concerns and our worries. He wants us to bring those to him. So he says that in verse 7, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. And he continues in verse 8, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. And he's saying, my disciples are going to bear much fruit. It's just going to be something that happens. Like, you're not even going to be able to help it. Just having that relationship with Jesus is going to produce fruit in your life. Uh, and and you know, whether you're trying to or not. Uh, here he's saying, when you abide in Jesus, God's going to be glorified in that. And, and people are going to see the fruit of the Spirit in your life. People are going to see the love of God in your life. People are going to see Jesus in your life. And, and just... You, it's going to be a side effect uh, of, um, I almost used the word symptom. That would be a bad word to use right now. Uh, but it, it would be almost, uh, it, it's just going to come, it's just going to come and flow out of having that relationship with, with Jesus. It's very similar to another passage. If you'll turn, you can keep your finger or your bookmark on John 15 because we will come back. But if you turn to Matthew chapter 7, in Matthew chapter 7, there's a very similar passage that helps us kind of understand this. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 20, 
starting in verse 15, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Get that part? You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. And a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear f good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Does that sound similar? Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. So he's talking about, I am the vine. You, he said, I am the true vine and, and you are the branches and it, the Lord's going to work in you. He's going to prune you and that you would bear fruit and it's very similar to this other passage where he's saying, hey, people are going to know you by your fruit. Uh, people are going to know you by what fruit you have in your life. If you proclaim to follow Jesus, but then you just leave this trail of rotten fruit behind you, <laughs> I don't think Jesus is considering you one of his followers. Uh, I think you have to actually follow him and actually do what he's saying to be considered a follower of Jesus. And, and here... He's saying, you will know them by their fruits. And he says, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. That's very similar to our John 15 passage we're in. And he says in verse 20, therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. You will know they're my disciples by their fruits. And God is pruning us and working on us. And we need to allow him to do that so that we can bear fruit for him because we want to be his followers. We want to be his disciples. We want to be following him and bear, bearing that good fruit that he wants us to be bearing. He continues in verse 9, As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. Here he, he, he says, as the Father loved me, also I have loved you. Abide in my love. He's saying remain in my love. I want to have a relationship with you, uh, so stay in one with me. Uh, when we decide to accept Jesus, what we're deciding is we're deciding we want to begin a relationship with him. And the blessing of that is that we don't, a lot of us sometimes fall into the thinking of thinking, I've accepted Jesus and his gift of salvation, so now I'm just waiting for eternity to start where I can be with him for eternity. But that's not what following Jesus looks like. He wants us to follow him here and now. And he wants us to begin a relationship with him here and now. And, and so here he's saying, as the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. And he says in verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Now this is a tricky verse. And a lot of people misuse this verse. <laughs> uh, he's, he's talking about, I have loved you, and I want you to abide in me. And he's giving us an example of abiding in God's love and obeying God in, obi in abiding in his love. He's, he's pointing out, he's giving us an example saying, I've been an example to you. You've seen how I abided in in the father's love jesus is telling us how i abided in the father's love in in doing that i did what the father was asking me to do and and i obeyed his commands because i wanted to show him i loved him jesus is saying i gave you that example and so what he's saying is i say he's saying i gave you this example of what it looks like to want to show God love through obedience. To want to, I want to show God how much I love him by obeying what he's asking me to do. 
Now, the tricky part and the part where people twist this verse and get it wrong is that what Jesus is not saying, he is not saying you have to do things in order for him to love you. Don't ever get that wrong and think that that's what he's saying. That is not what he is saying. He is not saying you have to do A, B, and C in order for Jesus to love you. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is he's saying that your love for Jesus should be shown by an obedience to him. Remember back when we were studying and he was talking to the Pharisees and he said, you call me Lord, Lord, but yet you don't do the things I ask. And, and it was kind of like Jesus was showing like, it breaks my heart that you call me Lord, but yet you don't do the things that I ask. And he was telling them, you can't call me Lord if you're not willing to obey what I've asked of you. And it's that same idea. He's saying, if you, if you want to talk about how much you love me, then show me how much you love me with obedience. And if, if we're always treating Jesus like, yes, Jesus, I love you, but I'm not willing to do anything you're asking of me, then we have to start to question how much do we really love him? Because he's not, he's not a top priority for us. If, if we're always acting like, oh, <laughs> I, I say I love Jesus, but every time Jesus asks me of something, I'm not willing, then maybe we don't really understand what we're saying when we say we love Jesus. But here Jesus is saying, You will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. He continues in verse 11, These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. <laughs> this is an awesome verse. It's, it's, he's saying in verse 11 that my joy may remain in you. Part of the reason he's begging us to abide in him is that he knows that's the source of our joy, is when we abide in him, we have that joy. When we abide in Jesus, uh, we have this joy that he wants to give us. You remember in, uh, in John chapter 10, in John chapter 10, when Jesus was speaking and giving the teaching on the good shepherd, he said, in John chapter 10, verse 10, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and may have it more abundantly. Jesus came to give us that joy and that joy comes through a relationship with him. And when we have that relationship with him, then we have that joy that's going to last. We have that joy that's going to, uh, going to remain in no matter what situation we're facing. And that was a huge part of me wanting to come to the Lord. Uh, I, I looked around, it was my senior year in high school, and I looked around to a lot of the kids on campus, and the ones that really seemed like they really had joy were going through really hard situations. And my life was good, but I was still felt like I was missing something, and I was you know, down about feeling like I was missing something. Uh, but other people were going through situations that I looked at and I'm like, that would probably break me. But they have this joy that doesn't make sense to me while they're going through this. And I started realizing that <laughs> they have Christ. And they have Christ. And that's, that's how they have this joy in this situation that they shouldn't have joy in, is they have... Christ and he's giving them this joy that's carrying them through. And so here he's, he's saying in verse 11, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. <laughs> it's awesome here that he said that your joy may be full. He doesn't say he's going to fill us up a little bit. He's like, I'm, I'm going full. Like I'm filling you up. Uh, so he says that your joy may be full. Verse 12, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Going back to John 13, remember when he, just, he had this last teaching with the disciples and he thought it was critically important to teach them love by serving. <laughs> love by serving other people. And so here he says, 
verse 12, this is my commandment to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. Follow Jesus' example of love. Love like he loved. Verse 13, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Very similar to Romans chapter 5, verse 8. God demonstrated his love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Here in verse 14 again, it's very similar to when he was talking in verse 10. Uh, he's He's not saying, when he says in verse 14, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you, he's not saying you have to do this in order to be my friend. What he's saying is he's saying, if you're going to call yourself my friend, then do as I've commanded. If you're going to say that you're my friend, then be my friend. We've all had friends that probably said they were our friends, but they didn't really act like it. When we needed them, they weren't there. Um... Maybe they betrayed us. Maybe they talked bad about us. Maybe they did something. We've all had people that maybe claimed to be friends, but really showed themselves to not be a friend. And, and so we know what that situation looks like. And Jesus is saying, don't do that to me. Jesus is saying, don't do that. Don't put a, a situation where uh, you're saying you're my friend, but you're not acting like it. So here he's saying, you are my friends if you do what I command. And then verse 15, this is the part, verses 15 through 17, this is the, this is the part that, uh, that introduced me to the Lord. And I talked in the beginning about this is the passage that brought me to, into a relationship with him. This is, this is the part. Here, verse 15, Jesus says, No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain, and that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you, that you love one another. So, when I was in my senior year of high school, when I was doing that searching and looking and, and seeing the people that had joy had Christ, and, and it, it made me start looking into things, uh, there was a night where I was in search of friends. I felt like I had a lot of people that were saying they were my friends, but I didn't really feel like I had a lot of people that if I needed them, I could count on them as friends. Uh, so I got out a piece of paper, <laughs> And I wrote on it friends, and I was only going to write on the paper the people that I knew I could count on as friends. And uh, I'm going to be honest with you, I stood, sat there with a blank paper for quite a long time. Uh, but I started writing some names of people that I knew they would be my friends, and if I needed them right then, they would come. And it was the names of all the annoying Christian club kids that I kept pushing away. <laughs> Uh, it was all the kids that kept preaching the gospel to me that I kept pushing away. They were the ones that I, they were the only ones I could write their names. And so I thought there's something to that. So in my search of a, of, of a true friend, I opened my Bible up and I opened up to this passage. No longer do I call you servants for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For the, all the things that I heard from my Father, I have made known to you. Here Jesus is saying, I call you a friend. And Jesus is saying he's not some God out there that's holding it, all the information back from us and just using us and manipulating us. That's not, that's not how the Lord works. But he's saying, <laughs> you serve me and that's true, but... I don't think of you as a servant. I think of you as my best friend. And to me, that was huge. That was, I was in a search for a friend and Jesus was saying, I am, I am your friend. I want to be your friend. Maybe you're in search. Maybe 
during this time of not being able to go places, maybe you're lonely. Maybe you're thinking, uh, <laughs> I need a good friend right now. Let him be that for you. Let Jesus be that friend for you. He definitely was for me, is for me. Uh, verse 16, he continues, you did not choose me, but I chose you. A lot of times we think of our following Jesus as when I decided to accept him. And we think of it as us choosing him. And really, Jesus is saying, you didn't choose me. I chose you. <laughs> Jesus is saying, I chose to die for you on a cross. For the joy <laughs> set before him, he endured the cross. Uh, so he's, he's saying, I chose you. I chose to seek it and to save you. I chose to begin a relationship with you. Uh, it's very similar when he says, I chose and appointed you. It reminds me of Jeremiah when, uh, when God's calling Jeremiah and, and Jeremiah is like, uh, I think you got the wrong person, Lord. I'm, I'm not the best person for this. And I'm a youth, and it was the lame excuse that Jeremiah offered up as he said, I'm young, I, you can't use me. And, and the Lord's response was, I made you, I formed you, I know who you are, and I made you for such a time as this. And, and so he, the Lord says, don't say to me, I can't use you because of your youth, because it's in your youth that I want to use you. And, and so the Lord has, <laughs> tells him point blank, like, I, I made you and I created you and I know who you are. And, and here Jesus is saying, I chose you. I chose to reconcile you to me. I chose that we would be reconciled and you would begin a relationship with me. Jesus is saying, I chose that. And he continues, I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. Again, he wants us to go and bear fruit. He's going to work on us. He's going to prune us. He's going to work in us and work on us. And then he's going to send us out that we would bear fruit. He says, I chose you and appointed you. Appointed you. That reminds me of... <laughs> When he says appointed, that reminds me of 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, when, when we're told to be good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Uh, when we're told to be good stewards of the grace of God, uh, to, to use our, our giftings and our talents that the Lord has given us, the character he's given us, the, the talents he's given us, the personality he's given us, to use that. He's chosen us and he's appointed us to use those things that he's given us to bear fruit. And he says here, if not only to bear fruit, verse 16, but to bear fruit that should remain. You see, everything we do for Jesus is going to, that fruit is going to remain for eternity. There are so many things that we do in the world that they're not going to remain. They're, they're, even if their impact remains here on earth, once it gets into eternity, they're going to mean nothing. And there's a lot of things that we do that, that, that in eternity, they're going to mean nothing. But here Jesus is saying, you can invest in doing, bearing fruit for the Lord, and that fruit is going to remain for eternity. It's going to be fruit that will remain. Then he continues again, and he brings back this verse, end of, end of 16. He says it again, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. So I think it's pretty important to Jesus that he wants us to ask him for things and depend on him and come to him in prayer, because now this is twice that he's said to do it in this one passage. He's, he says again, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. In verse 17, he says, these things I command you that you love one another. Again, he's going back to what he said in verse 12, love one another, love as he loved, love as Jesus loved. Verse 18, 
he continues uh, and he starts to transition a little bit, but he starts to talk about if you are a follower of Jesus and you have decided to follow him, then there's going to be certain things that happen because of that. And one of the things that's going to happen because of that is persecution. Now, as believers, we should never react to persecution surprised by it. <laughs> it should be expected. And that's a lot of what Jesus is about to teach us in these next verses is that if you're going to proclaim to follow him, then you need to expect to be treated the same way he was treated. And if he was persecuted, you're going to be persecuted also. Uh, if they didn't like when Jesus stood for righteousness, they're not going to like when you stand for righteousness. Uh, if they didn't like when he preached about following God's commands, then they're not going to like when you preach about following God's commands. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't do it. <laughs> Just because people don't like something doesn't mean we, we stop doing it. Uh, here he's going to tell us in verse 18, if the world hates you, you should know that it hated me before it hated you. So again, Jesus is trying to tell us, if you come into persecution because you started having a relationship with me and you started bearing fruit and glorifying God, like it's talking about here, and people respond to that persecuting you instead of being um, appreciative of that or, or rejoicing in that, <laughs> again, he says, it's, it's going to happen that they're going to, to come. They're going to hate you. If they hated him, they're going to hate you. Uh, and we can't let those situations steal our joy. Going back to when he was saying in verse 11, that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full, coupling that with going through persecution, uh, part of what really caught my eye when I was talking about before was when people were going through rough situations, but they still had that joy to carry them through. And that's what Jesus wants to do. When we're going through those times of persecution, he wants us to have that joy that will carry us through. If you think about it, Philippians is one of the books where the Apostle Paul talks about joy more than he does in most other books. Um, in that he uses the words joy and rejoiced over and over in, the, in that epistle. And it, it gives us one of the most famous verses um, in Philippians, talks about rejoicing always. Uh, <laughs> that book was written when he was under persecution, when he was under arrest, being persecuted. That's when he wrote that epistle. And so it, it's goes to show you how much Jesus wants to give us that joy to carry us through that persecution. He continues in, in verse 19, he says, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. <laughs> so if the world loves you, <laughs> that might be more concerning. <laughs> um, here he's, he's saying if the world would love its own. And if you blend it in with the world and you didn't uh, require that anybody change. You didn't uh, bring to notice or uh, uh, bring attention to the fact that people aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing or are doing what they're not supposed to be doing. If you didn't bring attention to that by the way you're living, then they would love you. Uh, but he's saying, if you were of the world, of course it would love you. But you're not of the world, so it's not going to, and it should be expected. Um if you are of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. One of the things the Lord's always on working on with me is, Adam, don't take it personally. <laughs> A lot of times I'll get in situations and I'll take it so personally. And then the Lord will be speaking to me. He'll be like, Adam, did that just happen to you? Or did that happen to the Lord? And was that something that, that you can take on personally, that it personally happened to you? Or is that something that, that just happened to Jesus in you? 
And, and so that's one of the things that the Lord has been working on in me for <laughs> as long as I've been allowing the word Lord to work on me. Um, but the, the Lord's been working on me. Don't take it personally. Uh, a lot of times we take our persecution so personally and the Lord's saying, don't. You should expect the persecution and when it does come, don't take it personally. It's not you they're attacking. It's not you they're hating. It's the Lord in you. In verse 20, he continues, Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. Okay, so he's saying if you have people that are not going to listen to the word, then Jesus had that. He had people that didn't listen when he preached. He had people that turned away from his teaching. In John chapter 6, when the teaching was too hard, many turned away. And, and so Jesus is saying if, if they turned away from him, they're going to turn away from us also. Uh, and the, the opposite is true as well. He ends, if they kept my word, they will keep yours also. And that goes to show we can't brag when we can't think that we're awesome and amazing and yeah, I'm super awesome because this many people decided to follow Jesus after I talked to you. They were deciding to follow Jesus, not follow you. <laughs> like It's not about you. Uh, don't take it personally in the bad way. Don't take it personally in the good way. Like It's, it's not about you. <laughs> and here he's saying in, in verse 20, he says that, and then in verse 21, but all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. He's saying those that are going to reject the Lord, they're going to do it because they don't know him. They're going to continue to reject him because they don't know how great it is to have a relationship with him. They're going to continue to push him away because they want to continue to hold on to their sin. And they know if they if they accept what you're telling them about Jesus, that means they have to let go of this sin they're holding on to. And some people just aren't willing to let go of the sin yet. And you can't take that personally. You can't take that as a failure. When you preach the gospel, you need to understand that it is not your responsibility how the people respond. It is not, not in any way on your shoulders how people respond when you preach the gospel. What is on your shoulders and what is your responsibility is did you preach the gospel like the Lord told you to? If you did, then you were faithful to do that. God is completely pleased with you. It doesn't matter what reaction you get. In the book of Acts chapter 17, it's a great passage and you can read it sometime. Uh, it, in Acts chapter 17, you can read and what Paul does is he gives this amazing teaching. And I don't want to spoil it for you. I'll let you look it up and read it. Uh, but I am going to spoil the ending a little bit for you because at the end it says there was three different reactions to his his teaching. And many mocked and ridiculed it. M many said, that sounds great, but we're not ready yet. We'll hear about it again sometime. And then many believed. So there was three responses that Paul got. Many mocked and ridiculed it and rejected the message. Or some said, yeah, that sounds good, but I'm not ready for it yet. I still got to want to hold on to the, the way I'm living my life. And I got some things I'm willing to not let go yet. And I'm not, I'm not willing to let go of yet. So I, I, I'm going to hold on to these things. And I'm not ready. Later I'll, I'll follow Jesus, but, but not yet. There's a group that did that. And then there's a group that fully accepted and fully believed. Now, this is the reaction you're going to get. You're going to get one of these three reactions anytime you step out and preach the gospel or stand up for Jesus or, or uh, be an example or a witness for Jesus. You're going to get one of these three reactions. And it's not on your shoulders and your responsibility which reaction you get. Even if everybody responds with the mocking and ridiculing and rejecting it, you still were completely faithful and did what the Lord asked you to do. And we're successful in that. And it reminds me of Stephen when he, he's teaching. And you can read that in the book of Acts, chapter 7. You can read where uh, Stephen is giving this teaching. And he looks up and he sees God super pleased with what he's doing. Now everybody else is not because... <laughs> 
I'll let you read how they reacted, but they did not react well. And it's uh, the worst reaction to a sermon that, that Stephen's ever had. Uh, but he looks up and he sees the Lord pleased. Uh, and it's that same kind of thing that even with everybody around you displeased or, or persecuting you, you can look up and you can see the Lord pleased. In verse 22, he continues, If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. So Jesus is saying that since he came and taught what he taught, now people can't use the, oh, I didn't know excuse. There's a lot of people that when they die and they're standing before God in judgment, they're going to say, oh, but I didn't know. And Jesus is going to say, yeah, you knew. You were taught this. Somebody preached this to you. Somebody preached this to you. You were taught. You knew. Uh, it's, and here Jesus is saying they can no longer use the excuse of I didn't know uh, because I came and I told them. And it reminds me of there was a situation years back. Uh, there was a situation where an NBA player uh, in the locker room like threatened another player with a gun or something. And, and so he got in trouble, a lot of trouble. Um, and got, you know, had to serve time and, and all these things. But his reaction in the beginning was like, was that wrong? <laughs> like, what do you mean I can't do that? Like, if somebody had told me I can't threaten somebody with a gun before, like, I wouldn't have, you know. But it was like this, like, weird, awkward situation where it's like, obviously, you should know better. Um, but he's trying to say, like, well, nobody told me that was wrong. <laughs> Uh, but that's the kind of thing Jesus is talking about. He's saying, like, you're not going to be able to claim, like, I didn't know that was wrong. He's not going to be able to claim that. You're not going to be able to claim that because the Lord has spoken. And Jesus is saying, because I came and taught what I taught, everybody's without excuse. At this point, if they're rejecting, they're not rejecting based on a lack of knowledge. They're rejecting based on they don't want they're rejecting based on they'd rather hold on to their sin than accept Jesus. He continues in verse 23, he says, He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. But this happened that the word might be fulfilled, which is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. So again, Jesus is saying, if they hated me, then they're going to hate you also when you stand for me, when you speak of me, when you preach of me. Um, it should just be expected. And then he ends with the last two verses. He ends with verses 26 and 27, uh, very similar to what he was teaching. You remember he was teaching that he had two last things he wanted to teach the disciples with his last night with them. And it was serve and love like I did. And serving and love like Jesus did. And and then he taught them rely on the help of the Holy Spirit. He taught them about there's a helper that's going to come for you uh, that's going to be help for you, that I'm going to send for you. And here in verse 26, he says, but when the helper comes whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, again, he started this passage with, I am the true vine. So, but when the helper comes whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. The Spirit is going to teach us about Jesus and testify to us about Jesus and about how to follow Jesus, how to abide in Jesus, how to rely on Jesus and lean on Jesus. The Spirit is going to work in us and on us in that way to teach us to be more like Jesus. And here, one of the great things he says in this verse is if you notice at the end of verse 26, he says, he will testify of me. One of the things that I think I neglected to mention last week when, or a couple of weeks ago when we were studying John chapter 14 is that the Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is not some force or entity. As much as I love Star Wars and the idea of the Force, that's not true. That's fiction. The Holy Spirit is a person. 
that's living inside us, that's working inside us and giving us access to God inside us so that we can be living for God, so that he can be testifying of Jesus inside of us, so that we can know when we're making a decision whether we should do something or not, we can know, oh, <laughs> yep, that's something Jesus would do. Yep, that's what Jesus told us to do. Yeah, Jesus told us to, or no, Jesus told us to stay away from that, so we need to stay clear far from that. The, that, the, work, the Spirit's going to work inside of us like that. So he says, the helper who's going to come to you, he will testify of me. He will testify of Jesus. And ending in verse 27, and you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. And he's saying to the disciples specifically, hey, look, you're going to be witnesses for me because you're going to physically be witnesses of me. Like you're going to be the main witnesses of my death and resurrection. So you're going to be witnesses for me and you're going to preach about being witnesses of the death and the resurrection. And you're going to be preaching that people can have their sins forgiven and can get salvation through this sacrifice on the cross and through this death and this this resurrection and you're going to be the witnesses of that and you're going to be the ones teaching on that and not everybody's going to accept that so don't take it personally when they don't and that's how he ends this chapter it's an amazing chapter it's a chapter that i, I really love and i i um this chapter is close to my heart and so i was very excited to teach it to you. I wish I could have been in person with you, but you know we make do with the situations that we have. Uh, but I hope you get a fraction out of it what I've gotten out of it in my lifetime because it's been an amazing chapter for me. Um, Lord, we just thank you. We thank you, Lord, for all that you have given us and and equipped us for and lord we just we thank you we pray that you would teach us to abide in you that you would teach us to uh, that you would teach us to abide in you always that lord we would treasure and cherish our relationship with you that we would uh, treasure and cherish being able to abide in you, Lord. I pray that you would teach us to do that. Um, Lord, during these uncertain times, Lord, I pray that you would teach us to abide in you even more. Lord, let us abide in you and have a hunger and a thirst for you like we've never had. And uh, Lord, we just pray this in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. All right. Well, keep tuned. Uh, come back to this site uh, for the studies for next week and check Calvary Chapel Stockton's website uh, for further messages next week. Thank you. God bless.